Friends, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know when you'll watch this, um, but we are actually doing what we love to call the ice storm taping because we're supposed to get a big ice storm tonight. So if we do get a storm and can't have church, we're going to publish this right online, which is why you're watching it right now. And uh, you'll be able to connect with uh, the teaching and the Word of God as a community, even though we're in different locations. So uh, pray with me, and we'll get started. Lord Jesus Christ, today we just put ourselves before your Word, and we ask that you would speak and lead in such a way that our hearts would be changed and transformed. We love you, God, and we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather, even if it might be in different locations, to gather together and to experience your grace and goodness. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. So today we're going to dive into Ephesians chapter 5. It's, um, it's often a misunderstood passage. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of misunderstandings that happen in life. Uh, you, you know, you, you have experiences where maybe, uh, I remember when I was young, I, I asked my brother if I could use, he had this little um, Chevy Love truck, and uh, I asked my brother if I could use it. Um, I meant jump it. He just thought I was going to the store. We had a slight misunderstanding, and I kind of tweaked the front of the the nose of the truck, and um, he was very unhappy with me. Now, he was getting a a different car. He was buying a different car, but he was really, um, he was ticked off at how how I I treated uh, the truck because I asked to use it, and I had a different plan for use than he did. The misunderstanding was pretty great uh, and, and it didn't work out real well in my favor. So when I look at that and I understand that there are misunderstandings between two brothers who grew up in the same household, who speak the same language and know the same culture, then I have to believe that there's misunderstood passages in scripture and we're going to deal with one of those today. Uh, the scripture today, Ephesians chapter 5, uh, 21 through chapter 6, verse 4. I'm going to read these. Uh, if you have your Bible, get it out and uh, follow along with me. Ephesians chapter 5, 21 is where we start. First off, uh, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the opening shot in 521. Paul just says submit to one another. He doesn't say men and women. He doesn't say different people. He just says submit to one another. And there's this reality going on that Paul is going to lean in. You can almost tell he's setting the tone for what's going to happen here. And there is um, kind of a, a sense of clarity and push by what Paul's about to say. And it's important that we hear it and maybe unpack how it's been misunderstood. Paul says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle in any blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for the body just as Christ does for the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one one flesh. In this, we see a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the very first commandment, with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and you may enjoy a long life on this earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So what we see here is there is a duality that Paul's talking about. In verse 22, you have this um, often misunderstood scripture of wives submit to your husbands. We often forget to tag on to that. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Which means this, husbands are to behave as Christ behaved. And husbands are supposed to love their wives to the extent that actually they submit their own living, their ability to continue living 
they, they're willing to lose their life in order to benefit their wife. And wives, out of that love from the husband, are supposed to respect and be able to trust a husband who will love themselves, love them as much as Christ loved the church. There's this duality, this tension, and really what we understand is this idea that Paul wrote about, uh, submit, is really critical for us. It's critical because it's a revolutionary instruction. What we recognize in the submission of, of wives to their husbands is this reality that God is setting certain things back in order. He's putting things in order. There's a Greek word um, that is called uh, hypotasso. And hypotasso is a primary military term to set things in order. When Paul says submit, he says hypotaste, which means that same thing. It's setting things in order in the family structure. There is the, a sense of authority, but we need to understand that even from Genesis, we remember that the woman was taken from the man's side in the creation narrative, out of his side, not out of his foot that he would rule over her and not out of his head that she would rule over him, but out of his side that the two would be equal. And we recognize our equality doesn't mean we're the exact same. It means we're perfectly fitted for one another in different roles. And we have to live into this. We often see this passage as old-fashioned. But when Paul was writing it, he was making a significant adjustment to the typical mindset of the Greco-Roman world. Where women were property. Women had no rights. Women were seen as something you possess. Children were seen as a possession. Slaves and uh, masters. There was, there was a situation where, uh, where there was men and everyone else below them. And what does Paul do in this? Paul reorients the value of humanity around Christ and the church. And what he does is he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Which means if you're betrayed, if you're hurt, if you're wounded, if you're all these things, so was Jesus. Love them anyway. And wives, submit to your husbands because he is trustworthy. Now, we recognize husbands, I know I, I mean, Erica would be the first to agree with this. I'm not, I am not as good at being a husband as Jesus is as being a husband to the church. I, I fail continually. I grow in that. But there is a respect and an honor between us because we recognize we are uniquely fitted for one another. And what we need to understand in the church is that Paul is not dealing with something like creating an old-fashioned rule. Paul is changing the world under the power of the Holy Spirit through the work of Christ to say, women are equal. Women are right here. And Jesus Christ loves and has purpose for women with independent thought and, and giftedness and unique capacities. And men are uniquely gifted to lead and to serve and to do other things. And we have to recognize that in our uniqueness, it is not something to be lorded over. It's something to serve the others. Paul requires husbands to love and care for their wives, children and servants. It's amazing. Remember what we said a couple weeks ago, <clears throat> excuse me, about the value of life in the Roman Empire? When we talked about how Roman Empire, the, the babies would often be aborted or thrown away. Life was valueless. They killed thousands of people in the arenas, the gladiatorial arenas, and the different things for entertainment. Life was of low value. What do we see? Paul is saying, care for your wives. They're not property. They're created in the image of God and they're valuable and respect and love them. And not only that, care for your children. Their lives matter. And not only your children, care for your slaves. This was an era of slavery. Care for them and honor them. Not only does Paul kind of give this sense of worth to people, but he elevates the wives, the children, and, the, and the, the children and the slaves by making them part of the equation 
of the church family, of the church structure. They're valuable members. Every member playing its own role. He gives purpose and responsibility in living out the faith to children, to wives, to slaves, to husbands. Everybody has a responsibility in nurturing and growing an individual relationship with Jesus Christ that gives them worth and a sense of identity and, and, he, and he calls them to understand they are not just passive bystanders. This call to submit to wives is not one of subjugation. It's one that says, I know that my role in this is to trust my husband and husbands, we need to understand our role in this. And too often we have taken it as an opportunity to be abusive, neglectful, and arrogant. And that is not biblical, and it's not okay. The men of the church who are husbands need to understand the high calling that comes from this. We need to understand what Jesus modeled. And you could say, well, Eric, this is a, an epistle, a, a letter written from Paul. But Jesus modeled something for us that doesn't allow us to say, well, women can't lead. Women can't, you know, carry out gifted leadership and um, be a, an important part of the kingdom of God. That is not biblical. What we need to understand is what Jesus modeled. I want you to hear something with me. It comes out of the, the book of John, uh, chapter 13, verses uh, 14 to 16. And it's going to um, kind of readjust. Think of going to the chiropractor when your neck's off and he goes, whack. And you're like, oh, and it hurts. But then you're like, oh, it's right again. We're going to have an adjustment that's going to feel better once it's done, but it hurts a little. If you're in here and you think, no, I, I don't have to love my wife or, or elevate other people around me to, to experience the grace of God and the love of Jesus Christ because I'm in a better position. This is what Jesus said. This is what Jesus did. Now, the words of Jesus. John chapter 13. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Now that I have washed your feet, wash one another's. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent them. Paul is writing this after the Great Commission when Jesus said, go into the world and preach the gospel to all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They were sent What's going on in this Ephesians passage, we can look at this and realize Paul has been sent by God. He is not greater than his master. He is not greater than the one who sent him. Paul is recognizing the unique giftedness of every member of the church, regardless of their age, their gender, and their sense of worth by being um, either an employee or an employer, to use a modern term. What we need to understand is Jesus said by his deeds that there is no hierarchy. There is mutual submission to one another in love. Doing for others as Christ has done for us. I think it's important to note that um, before we read this next text, we actually discussed this in a devotion uh, done recently in the family devotions we put out. And it comes out of Luke 22 uh, verses 24 to 27 and it says this. A dispute arose among them, the disciples, as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. The disciples are wondering, who's the best? Who's most in charge? Who, who really actually has Jesus' favor in this? And Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors people who do good to people below them, to their subjects. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest. And remember, in this culture, youth was not valuable. They were just mouths to feed and they were pretty worthless in the cultural mindset. So you should be like the youngest, the least valuable. And the one who rules like the one who serves. So the ruler should act and carry himself as a servant. 
Oh, man. Okay, so let's just go on. Verse 27, for who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves at the table? Is not the one who is at the table greater? And then Jesus says, but I am among you as one who serves. And he's creating this paradox where the people cannot look at Jesus and say, he is endorsing authoritarian leadership. What Jesus is endorsing is equality under the headship of Christ. And that our submission one to another, remember how Paul opened this, submit yourself to one another out of reverence for Christ. So when Paul says that, he understands that we are all submitted under the lordship of Jesus. And our value comes not from our status, our income, our capacity to um, generate followers and different things. It comes out of, our status comes out of, will we serve as Jesus served? And that is not something that churches often take on as an identity. We're servant-hearted because servants are seen as lesser than. But in the kingdom of God, Jesus came, and even though he was deserving to be served, he came to serve, not to be served. For us, this is really vital. Jesus doesn't allow for arrogance of domination. He doesn't allow for husbands who say, submit to me and then behave poorly as men of God in their own homes. Abusive, neglectful, arrogant, prideful husbands are held in check by being held to a standard that is impossibly high. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's a high standard. Wives are held to a very difficult standard, and it's understood in our culture to be negative, but it's not. To submit and trust someone is actually um, uh, a wonderfully bonding and intimate thing. To be together and to trust someone. I think one of the hardest things I've learned is um, as a dad with uh, one of my children starting to drive, I've always, I love to drive. It's something I love to do. I've always, um, ever since Josh started driving, and he's a great driver, he's cautious, he's responsible. I love it. But the reality is I struggle because I'm out of control. And to submit myself and just sit quietly and ride is almost impossible. We have a rule in our family. If you're in the passenger seat, you can give instruction. But if you're in the back seat, you can't. I literally chew on the seat sometimes <laughs> if I'm in the back seat because it's hard for me to submit to another person being in control of my family, of my safety. And it's a small thing, but it really is a telltale sign to me that I have control issues in life. I have real control issues because I want to keep everything as I like it. So when I look at this, I realize that what we're called to is a, is a painful breaking of the will that we would submit to one another under the lordship of Jesus. And as a husband, I would love my wife even if it's to my own detriment. And if, if it's my wife that she would trust and respect me and be willing to follow when necessary. But also know that she's got a full-throated response to speak back to me as my equal. We can't just marginalize people and think that Jesus thought it was okay. He didn't. He rose everybody up to a new level. Jesus brought people up to new levels of freedom in Christ. So, how does this apply to me? I believe the world can see Christ through a loving family that respects and serves one another. It's countercultural. It's countercultural. It is crazy to think of a family that loves and respects one another in public and private spheres. But the reality is that's what we're called to be. We're called to love and respect one another under the lordship of Christ and knowing our place in the system. God set an order to the family system. So if I'm unwilling to submit to prefer the members of my own home over myself, we need to ask the question, why? Why would you be unwilling to submit? I had to do that, and I have to do that with driving. It's really hard. But for me, one of the common culprits is I want control. I want control. Okay, and I can admit that pretty readily. But let me ask this. Wives, do you refuse to submit to your husband's leadership because you want to control everyone in the family? 
I think that can be a dynamic that's hard. A, a lot of moms, a lot of wives, they, they want to do that. Not because you're bad, but because you want things ordered a certain way. You know kind of how the sausage is made, right? You know the hard work behind the scenes to make things happen. So you control them to keep status quo or keep things functioning. But the reality is, sometimes control or order isn't the best thing. Sometimes it's the relationship that matters more and a learning opportunity that's a little more painful than the status quo is required. Prideful is the next thing. Parents, and I want to push on this with parents. Parents, do you lord authority over your children or do you teach them humility by actively listening and apologizing when you're wrong? That's hard. That's probably the hardest thing for me. To apologize when I'm wrong to someone, my own children, who I provide everything for. Erica and I provide everything for our children, as you do for yours, right? And it's hard to say when you're wrong and be like, oh, guys, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have kind of lost my temper at you about that. It was my fault. It's hard to do that. But the question is, are we too prideful to do that? And do we lord authority over them? Do we force them to say they're sorry and force them to be contrite, but we never model that behavior? That's not Christian. That's not how Christ would do it. Christ modeled behaviors. He washed the disciples' feet and said, now go wash one another's feet. But what's the natural inclination? It's what was going on in Luke 22. A dispute, which one of us is greatest? Which one of us is greatest? Who's in most control? Kids, kids, students, children, are you disrespectful? You may be surprised to know this. But God takes disrespect and rebellion very seriously. Actually, in the Old Testament, disrespect, um, better, it's better said rebellion. Rebellion is seen as the, as the equal in sin to witchcraft, which seems pretty serious, right? Rebellion and witchcraft are held kind of side by side, which tells us this, that we as kids in our own homes, have a role. And we learn how to submit and respect and trust in those settings. But your parents should allow you a voice, not just in some decisions, but also in the family system. Can you raise your voice respectfully? Finally, husbands, do you serve your family like Christ? Do you take the lowest thankless jobs or do you just do what you want? and make everyone else in your family work around you? That's a hard question to face. But we have to look at it and understand that we as husbands have often missed the mark. There's this idea, this concept of me time in our culture, and it's toxic to family. I'm not saying we don't need time as individuals, but as husbands, we are called to serve before we are called to replenish ourselves. We are called to serve our families. And I think one of the realities is when you ask the question, do you take the lowest thankless jobs? You, most husbands, I would think, be like, no, I don't. Most, not all. Most husbands would say, no, I don't do the thankless jobs. I leave that for someone else. That's why I have kids. No, my wife does it. But Christ washed the feet of his disciples. Christ served at great cost to himself. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That is the reminder coming back to us from the Apostle Paul. That is the great equalizer. It's the raising up of the other members of the household and the recognition that the unhealthy patriarchy is coming back into balance with an equality in the family where the husband serves and loves, the wife is able to submit and respect, the children respect and honor and obey, and we see this whole system beginning to work in a way that honors not only God and the church, but it reveals Christ to the world through our very families. It reveals Christ through the family to the world around us. So what does this look like? How do we do it? First off, it's preferring one another. Preferring one another. I think some of my favorite memories are when, um, when I remember uh, my older brother preferring me uh, over himself. 
I loved Dairy Queen when I was little. Lincoln loved Baskin Robbins. And um, there were times um, when we would be like, let's go get ice cream. And I remember my brother a couple of times saying, you know, talking about what he wanted. He had a certain thing he loved at Baskin Robbins. I think it was daiquiri ice. But, um, but it was this ice cream he, he super loved. And I remember one time, very specifically, um, he said, it's fine. We can go where Eric wants to go. And it meant the world to me. He preferred me, and I didn't see it coming. And that was 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago. Oh, my gosh, I'm getting old. Um, that was more than 30 years ago. And I can still remember sitting in the back seat and him going, it's okay, we can go where Eric wants to go. It just, he preferred me. He gave up what he wanted because seeing me get what I wanted made him happy for some reason. When we prefer one another, we begin to respect and love one another, and submission doesn't become the issue. It's not an issue anymore to submit because we live in mutual submission for each other's best. This doesn't just apply to married people with children. This applies to all families because we're all part of a family. Your sons, your daughters, your aunts, your uncles, nieces, nephews, cousins, brothers, sisters. You have these things. And family dynamics get kind of janky sometimes when you, um, when you have you know, broken relationships at big birthday gatherings or holidays. I mean, one of the, the holiday, the, the day of the year where America consumes the most alcohol per capita is the day before Thanksgiving. That's saying something, isn't it? That's saying that a lot of people have to tie one on before they go see the whole family because there's brokenness there. What if we went into those situations with the mindset of preferring those around us instead of what are they going to do this year? Asking the question, what can I do? How can I be a servant to those who maybe don't deserve it? How can I be a servant and care for those? How can I prefer, prefer the family members in my family system? Not me. We need to understand that these principles apply. In the immediate family, husband, wife, children, and then, you know, the, the family system. And then you can move it to grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews. Grow it out. And then, what's the church called? The family of God. Can you look here and say, you know what? I can, I can look at this church and know that, no, there's not an organ, but I can prefer the younger generation who enjoys a different style of worship and celebrate that they're meeting Christ here. For us, the challenge is one of self-sacrifice. Not just to be sacrificial, but to raise up the people around us so that their lives fully reflect the gospel and Jesus Christ. Pray with me. God, give us the courage to live in the ethic you've created that um, under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we are called to serve one another out of reverence and love for you. Help us to be your church, giving witness to you in our families and the way we love, care, and prefer one another. May we, your church, submit to the life you lived. In Jesus' name, amen.